afternoon, everybody. And on behalf of the Socialist Equality Party, the British section of the International Committee, the Fourth International, and on behalf of the World Socialist website, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone in attendance today. Now, tomorrow in London, the political show trial of the 21st century begins. Not just the life of Julian Assange, but the democratic rights of the international working class hang in the balance. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom from illegal and arbitrary detention, freedom from torture, the right to political asylum and to illegal defense. The United States is seeking to redefine journalism as espionage. Any journalist who exposes war crimes, illegal mass surveillance and global diplomatic intrigues by the major imperialist powers will be destroyed. The Assange precedent is already taking effect with police raids against journalists in Australia, charges against Glenn Greenwald by the Bolsonaro government in Brazil, and the threatened use of the Official Secrets Act against journalists in Britain. This meeting sends its warmest greetings to Julian Assange, now languishing in a British prison while the war criminals go free. And we send our greetings to the courageous whistleblower Chelsea Manning, re-jailed for refusing to testify against Assange and now in the 12th month of detention in the William G. Truesdale Federal Detention Center in Virginia. Now on Wednesday, Manning issued a defiant declaration to the federal court. She said, I have been separated from my loved ones, deprived of sunlight, and could not even attend my mother's funeral. It is easier to endure these hardships now than to cooperate to win back some comfort and live the rest of my life knowing that I acted out of self-interest and not principle. Now the World Socialist website has been at the forefront of the defense of Julian Assange from WikiLeaks. In 2010, as his media organization came under attack by the Obama administration, the WSWS and the Socialist Equality Party held public meetings in Sri Lanka, the UK, Germany, Australia, and the United States. We published more than 100 articles in the last half of that year alone explaining the impact of the WikiLeaks revelations and their political implications. At one of those meetings, the SCP's Nick Beams, a leading writer for the WSWS, explained, the WikiLeaks release has sent a shockwave around the world because the real nature of so-called diplomacy is being revealed. It recalls the reverberations that accompanied an earlier release of diplomatic secrets, that carried out by Leon Trotsky as People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs in the Soviet government that came to power in the Russian Revolution of November 1917. In a statement accompanying the release of those documents from the files of the Tsarist government, Trotsky wrote, Secret diplomacy is a necessary tool for the property minority which is compelled to deceive the majority in order to subject it to its interests. Imperialism, with its dark plans of conquest, and its robber alliances and deals develop the system of secret diplomacy to the highest level. The struggle against imperialism, which is exhausting and destroying the peoples of Europe, is at the same time a struggle against capitalist diplomacy, which is cause enough to fear the light of day. The Russian people and the peoples of Europe and the whole world should learn the documentary truth about the plans forged in secret by the financiers and industrialists together with their parliamentary and diplomatic agents. The peoples of Europe have paid for the right to this truth with countless sacrifices and universal economic desolation. Now these words, written more than 90 years ago, resonate so powerfully today, as was said in 2010, as the WikiLeaks documents make clear that the same imperialist intrigues against the world's people are still being carried out. Now more than a century later, the importance of these words is clearer still. Assange stands not only against the Trump administration, but against all the blood-stained machinery of world imperialism, including the Johnson government. He is the victim of the active conspiracy of the UK, the US, Australia, Ecuador, and Sweden, of their corrupt judicial systems, reactionary politicians, and most vile corporate journalists. And he is the victim of a conspiracy of complicit silence on the part of all the other governments and capitalist parties of the world. They share fundamentally the same objective, 
The major imperialist powers are preparing for new wars of plunder in the Middle East and Africa. And increasingly, in the words of the United States Department of Defense, for great power conflict. That is with Russia, China, and amongst themselves. For the ruling class, their past crimes must be covered up to prepare new and more terrible crimes. Critical voices must be silenced and democratic rights eviscerated. Now in a world of rapidly escalating inter-imperialist tensions and conflicts, the one thing they could all agree on is the need to make an example of Julian Assange. Because the battle none of them want to face is the anti-war struggle of the working class who were outraged by what the WikiLeaks reveals proved to them about their own governments. There are very few comparisons which could be made with this case, but they are instructive. We were the first to draw the parallels with the Dreyfus case in late 19th century France. Then there is the example of Sacco and Vanzetti, two Italian-American anarchists framed and executed by the US government in the early 20th century as part of a campaign of terror against the workers' movement. Now, what these cases demonstrate above all is that the fate of Assange and Manning cannot be left to one or another section of the establishment, which all over the world is turning to authoritarianism and to the far right. It depends on the broad defense of democratic rights, which is inseparable from the struggle of the vast majority of humanity against destructive levels of social inequality, anti-migrant xenophobia, and predatory wars. It is this social force which must be mobilized in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Today, we will hear from three speakers from the three countries which have spearheaded Assange's persecution, who will outline a political perspective for that mobilization. I'm very pleased to introduce our first, Oscar Grenfell, who has traveled a very long way to be here. Oscar is a national committee member of the SEP in Australia and a staff writer for the World Socialist website. His writings in defense of Assange and Manning are followed by a large international audience. And he will speak on the role of the Australian government and political establishment in the decade-long persecution of Assange, himself an Australian citizen. His report will discuss the growing popular opposition to Assange's persecution and the political issues now posed in the fight for his freedom. Please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you very much, and it is a great privilege to speak at this meeting which underscores the global character of our party's fight for the freedom of Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, and all imprisoned whistleblowers, journalists, and publishers. I must say that the events in Britain uh, defending Assange, whether they've been organized by the JADC, the SEP, or other organizations, have had a huge impact uh, in Australia and internationally. They've given expression to the immense popular sympathy for Assange, here in the country that's holding him as a political prisoner and preparing to hand him over to the war criminals in Washington. They've demonstrated that on the Assange case, as on every other major issue, there are two Britons. On the one hand, the official political parties, the Johnson government, the intelligence agencies and the military, and on the other, millions of workers and young people who are entering into major struggles for their social and democratic rights. It's the British authorities that are holding the key to Assange's cell, but, that, but they couldn't have trampled on all of his legal and democratic rights as they have, were it not for the criminal role played by successive Australian governments. Since 2010, all of them have refused to defend Assange, despite the fact that he's a persecuted Australian citizen and journalist. Instead, they've been among the most enthusiastic participants in the US-led vendetta against Assange and have given succor to all of the lies and slanders that are being used to isolate him. Indeed, Australian governments have been out in front when it comes to the government attempts to shut WikiLeaks down. In 2009, that is a year before the publication of Collateral Murder and the Iraq and Afghan war logs, Julian revealed that he was avoiding spending time in Australia. He said he received a tip-off that if he returned to his country of origin, he would be raided by the Australian Federal Police on the orders of the then Labor government. The reason was that in 2009, WikiLeaks had released Labor's secret list of blacklisted websites. 
The publication revealed that contrary to government claims, the targeted sites included political and news websites which had nothing to do with illegal content, that is, out and out political censorship. Now in 2010, when WikiLeaks released the truly historic publications for which Assange has been charged, the Greens-backed Labor government of Julia Gillard reacted with unbridled hostility. Gillard fronted a press conference in December 2010 at which she declared, quote, the foundation stone of the WikiLeaks organization is an illegal act. She pledged to aid the US authorities in their campaign to destroy Assange. Now Gillard said this the same time that senior US politicians were calling for Assange to be assassinated. The transparent purpose of her statement was to block any prospect of Assange's return to Australia and to promote the lies that he was a cyber terrorist. The Australian police were subsequently compelled to state that Assange and WikiLeaks, in fact, had committed no crime under Australian law. Now, it should be noted that since leaving Parliament, Gillard has reinvented herself as a champion of women's rights. She's appeared at speaking events alongside Hillary Clinton, at which the two persecutors of Assange have been lauded by the corrupt representatives of the upper middle class as feminist heroes. The collaboration of the US-led vendetta against Assange has been continued by every Australian government since. Current Conservative Prime Minister Scott Morrison has declared that no one is above the law and that Assange must face the music. After he was fawned over by Donald Trump during a visit to Washington late last year, an Australian reporter asked Morrison whether the two had discussed Assange. Morrison simply laughed. The Labor Party opposition's response has been no less criminal. Senior Labor leader Tanya Plibersek responded to Assange's arrest on April the 11th by sharing a tweet that declared, quote, there are many cultists on this site, but the Assange cultists are the worst. The Labor, senior Labor figure branded Assange as a foreign agent guilty of fascist behaviour and of seeking to undermine democracy. In November, Labor MPs shut down one of the only discussions in the Australian Parliament over the past 12 months uh, over Assange's plight using anti-democratic procedural rules. The hostility of the Australian political and media establishment towards Assange is completely tied to their support for the US military alliance and all of Washington's predatory wars and military preparations. This connection was exemplified by the Gillard government. In 2011, Gillard hosted Barack Obama as he announced from the floor of the Australian parliament a massive military build-up throughout the Asia-Pacific directed against China, the so-called pivot to Asia. Gillard signed a secret military agreement with Obama which included the establishment of a new US Marine base in Northern Australia and virtually unlimited access to existing Australian bases for US troops. This was on top of the already existing Pine Gap spy, spy base in Central Australia. Operated by the CIA, it's involved in all, uh, coordinating all US drone strikes in the Middle East and North Africa. Edward Snowden also revealed that Pine Gap plays a key role in the NSA's mass surveillance program. Now, in the think tanks and foreign policy journals in Australia, it's openly discussed that the country has been placed on the front lines of US plans for war with China. This agenda, um, imposed behind the backs of the population, has been accompanied by rafts of national security legislation and an anti-China campaign aimed at whipping up a wartime atmosphere. Australia's support for the persecution of Assange is also bound up with the attempts of the ruling elites to suppress mounting social and political opposition. We've seen how explosive the situation is over the past several months. Almost overnight, all of the myths about Australia being the lucky country and the land of a fair go were exposed as lies by one of the worst bushfire crises in decades. The fires killed 33 people and destroyed more than 2,300 homes. The catastrophe was not a natural disaster. It was the direct result of government funding cuts, including to firefighting services and the refusal of every government uh, to tackle the climate change crisis. Prime Minister, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who had been lauded in the financial press just months before,
war as a force for stability has now become a figure of mass hatred, a symbol of the contempt of the ruling elites for the needs and the very lives of ordinary people. The political establishment is aware that it sits atop a social power gap. That's why the Australian government has been among the most aggressive in deploying the Assange precedent. In June last year, the Australian Federal Police raided the Sydney headquarters of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC. The raid targeted journalists who had revealed evidence of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan, including the killing of civilians and the desecration of corpses. The day before, the Federal Police had raided the home of a News Corp political editor for exposing government plans to expand mass domestic, mass domestic uh, spying. In both cases, the journalists uh, could still face prosec prosecution. Now, it's no coincidence that those raids were carried out only weeks after the Trump administration released its Espionage Act indictment of Assange. Last week, a federal court upheld the legality of the raid on the ABC. In language that could have been borrowed from the US indictment of Assange, the Australian judge cited as precedent a ruling which declared, quote, the public interest in national security necessarily outweighs the public interest in the free flow of information. The raids followed the bipartisan passage of foreign interference laws in 2018. They provide for prison sentences for whistleblowers and journalists who expose national security material. Under the new laws, it's an offence for a journalist even to receive uh, classified government information in an email from a whistleblower. In parliamentary submissions, WikiLeaks has warned that the new legislation would directly threaten its own publishing activities were it based in Australia. In other words, as Assange has stated, the attacks against Tim are only the sharpest expression of a much broader assault on press freedom. Our experiences in Australia have demonstrated the essential point that's been raised in this meeting. That is that the fight for Assange's freedom requires the political mobilisation of the working class. It's not going to be achieved through Parliament or through the official political parties. Since Assange's arrest last year, the Australian Greens, the pseudo-left groups and the unions have done nothing to mobilise opposition to his persecution. Many here will have seen the visit to Belmarsh Prison by Australian MPs Andrew Wilkie and George Christensen last week. They're the co-chairs of a cross-party group of Australian parliamentarians calling for Assange to be brought home. It must be stressed that this group was formed in October and prior to Wilkie and Christensen's British tour, it had literally held no public events or initiatives in the four months since. I think the MPs came here after considerable pressure was applied by defenders of Assange and democratic rights. Their visits were only a pale reflection of the immense support that exists for Assange among workers and young people. I want to provide just a few examples. Earlier this month, a petition demanding freedom for Assange was tabled in Parliament. It's been signed by over 280,000 people, making it one of the largest in the 120 years of the Australian Parliament. Last week, the Hills Association of Sydney Schools passed a motion which declared, quote, we insist that the federal Morrison government use its diplomatic powers to organise the safe return of Assange to Australia we resolved to send this resolution to other schools and workplaces. The committee which passed that motion represents 1,300 teachers across Sydney, and their action followed a similar motion uh, passed by teachers at a working class school in Western Melbourne uh, demanding freedom for Assange. It won an international audience after being fe featured on Jimmy Dore's popular online show. For many years, support for Assange has been suppressed, but now it's coming to the surface, and I think we can anticipate that it will grow substantially over the coming weeks and months. I want to finish by citing a comment made by Terry Hicks to the WSWS last year in support of Assange. Terry's son, David Hicks, was arrested by the US military in Afghanistan in 2001. He was taken to Guantanamo Bay and subjected to torture despite the fact that he was guilty of no crime. For years, Terry waged a one-man campaign for his son's freedom. In the end, he built a powerful grassroots movement, 
that forced the Australian government to take action to have David Hicks released from Guantanamo Bay and return to Australia. Comments to us last year, Terry said, you might get support from high profile people, but the fight to gain Julian's freedom depends on ordinary people speaking out. You will win them if you explain the basic issues at stake, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and democratic rights, and you'll be respected for your determination and your honesty. Always remember that the story constantly alters for those who lie, but if you're tell telling the truth, then nothing changes and the real story will eventually come out. So I think those are fine words as we begin the next stage in the fight for Julian Assange's freedom. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph Kishore, the National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in America and the party's candidate for President of the United States in the 2020 presidential elections alongside Marissa Santa Cruz as Vice President. Now, in a powerful video released last month, Kishore and Santa Cruz made clear that our election campaign is being conceived of as an international offensive for socialism. Now, as everyone here definitely understands, our comrades in the US are well and truly fighting from the belly of the beast. The United States is the world's most powerful imperialist power and the chief architect of the international criminal vendetta to destroy Assange and WikiLeaks. It is being driven in this by an immense and historic crisis of capitalist rule, an eruption of militarism and war, explosive levels of social inequality, and the collapse of all democratic forms of rule expressed in the fascistic presidency of Donald Trump. Now we are very proud be able to have Joe speaking at today's meeting in London and encourage everyone here to follow his own campaign very, very closely. And for a range of technical reasons, we have pre-recorded his contribution, but please I invite you to a show of a warm welcome nonetheless. <laughs> Party's candidate for US president, I condemn the torture and persecution of WikiLeaks publisher and journalist Julian Assange. The SEP opposes Assange's extradition to the United States. We demand immediate freedom for Assange and for whistleblower Chelsea Manning, who remains in jail for refusing to testify before a grand jury convened to file additional charges against Assange. The extradition hearings that begin formally on Monday are a legal travesty. Throughout his incarceration in the UK's Belmarsh prison, Assange has been denied the most basic requirements for his legal case. The United Nations' Nils Melzer has said that the conditions in which he has been held amount to torture. This by itself nullifies any legal proceedings and requires his immediate freedom. Assange is a political prisoner. He has been targeted because he has exposed the truth. He has exposed the crimes of American imperialism and the crimes of the ruling class. He's done what journalists should do, inform the population about what is really going on. For this, he's been hounded by Swedish prosecutors, forced to seek refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, spied on by American intelligence agencies, dragged from his only place of security by British police, imprisoned in a maximum security prison, and targeted for addition to the United States, where he would face life in prison or worse. Those responsible for this international witch hunt against Assange include the governments of the United States, Britain, Sweden, and Australia. They include the media, which has shamelessly and relentlessly slandered Assange. They also include the pseudo-left organizations that have spread lies to justify his persecution. All those who have actively or tacitly supported this pseudo-legal abomination have upon them a black mark that can never be washed clean. Here in the United States, the entire political establishment has participated in the persecution of Assange. The Trump administration is continuing the vendetta against him initiated by the Obama administration as part of its wholesale attack on democratic rights. Trump leads a government of the far right with distinctly authoritarian and fascistic characteristics. 
He's sending SWAT teams into cities throughout the country to terrorize immigration community, immigrant communities and carry out mass roundups. He has threatened to unleash the military against countries throughout the world. He displays a complete contempt for the basic democratic principles. However, it is the Democratic Party that has played the leading role in targeting WikiLeaks and Assange. From the beginning of the Trump administration, there were, in fact, mass protests against his fascistic policies. The Democrats worked to smother these protests and channel them behind their own reactionary pro-war agenda. What is the central issue upon which the Democrats have waged their supposed opposition to Trump? That he is an agent of Vladimir Putin, that he has failed to pursue an aggressive enough policy against Russia. A central aim of the anti-Russia campaign, which has assumed levels that can only be compared to the neo McCarthy witch hunts of the 1950s, has been the fight to fight out differences over foreign policy. However, an additional motivation, by no means secondary, has been to criminalize domestic opposition. The targeting of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange is part of an, of an effort to tar all opposition to American imperialism and the policies of the ruling class as the operations of a foreign power. In fact, this is now being revived in the 2020 elections in the form of unsubstantiated claims originating from U.S. intelligence agencies that Russia is intervening in the elections to bolster the campaign of Bernie Sanders. To further the reactionary anti-Russia narrative, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other media have relentlessly slandered Assange as a Russian agent and depicted him as a linchpin of a conspiracy hatched in Moscow to intervene in the 2016 U.S. elections. This is and has always been a lie. It is a lie used to justify the torture of Assange. It is a lie used as a pretext for internet censorship. It is a lie used to suppress free speech and a free press. In the 2020 elections, the extradition of Assange is not even a subject of debate. None of the major Democratic Party candidates have spoken up out against the extradition hearings, let alone oppose them. They support what is being done to Assange because they support American imperialism. And this includes the supposed socialist Bernie Sanders. Sanders has won widespread support in the primaries from workers and young people because of his calls for a political revolution against the billionaire class and his appeal to anti-war sentiment. However, Sanders' main role has been to try to keep mass opposition within the framework of the right-wing Democratic Party and to promote the fiction that anything can be done through this instrument of the military intelligence agencies in Wall Street. In a recent interview to the New York Times, Sanders declared that he would in fact consider military force to preempt an Iranian or North, Korea, or North Korean nuclear missile test. He also declared that the United States should consider Russia an adversary or even an enemy. The Democrats and Sanders are also silent on the continued incarceration of Chelsea Manning, who has stood as a model of courage in her refusal to testify against Assange. For this, this, she has been in prison for nearly a year for so-called contempt of court. Just this past week, Manning filed another motion for her release. She said, I have been separated from my loved ones, deprived of sunlight, and could not even attend my mother's funeral. It is easier to her to endure these hardships than now than to cooperate to win back some comfort and live the rest of my life knowing that I acted out of self-interest and not principle. Manning has been fined million, nearly half a million dollars and she could face thousands and thousands more in fines and seven months in jail if her appeal for release is not granted. The fight to free Assange and Manning and to defend democratic rights must be connected to the fight against imperialist war and the capitalist system. Their persecution takes place under conditions of growing class conflict and social unrest throughout the world. The oligarchs and war criminals are well aware that their policies are encountering mass resistance. By making an example of Assange, they are seeking to silence all opposition. If Assange is extradited to the United States, the same can be done to any journalist, publisher, or activist who falls afoul of the American government. The greatest mistake, however, would be to harbor illusions that Assange will be free through the actions of any faction of the state. Fruitless appeals directed towards Sanders in the United States or Corbyn in the UK are worse than useless. They can only serve to strengthen the political institutions and parties 
responsible for Assange's persecution. The working class must fight to free Assange and Manning and to defend democratic rights through its own independent organization. The past year has seen mass demonstrations and strikes throughout the world. In the United States, strike action is at its highest level in nearly three decades. There is growing support for socialism and opposition to capitalism among workers and youth. In these elections, the Socialist Equality Party pledges to connect the fight to free Assange and Manning with the independent political mobilization of the working class against war, fascism, authoritarianism, inequality, and the capitalist system. Thank you. As mentioned, you can follow Joseph Kishore's presidential campaign through the World Socialist website. We do encourage you to do so. Our final speaker is Chris Marsden, the National Secretary of the SCP in Britain and a member of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website. And Chris will of course be familiar to many of you. He has actively campaigned for Assange and Manning's freedom for the past decade. And I invite you to give him as well a warm welcome. Well, comrades and friends, the effort to imprison and silence Julian Assange, and therefore the struggle to defend him, has already stretched over almost a decade. It began when the framework was first concocted in Sweden in August 2010, leading to the Swedish international arrest warrant in November, and then Assange seeking asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy on June 19th. 2012. Many of you here in this room have been fighting to defend Assange ever since. Tom noted that the International Committee of the Fourth International and the Socialist Equality Parties held their first meetings on Assange in 2010 in Australia, in Sri Lanka, Germany, the United States and here in Britain. Since then, we've written over 700 articles specifically on Assange and over 2,000 in which he has made a point of reference in calls to oppose imperialist war, colonialism and war crimes. On August 18, 2012, Barry Graham and myself wrote a perspective for the World Socialist website which said this, there is no serious legal basis for the allegations of sexual abuse against Assange. Not since the 1930s, with the triumph of fascism in much of Europe and the build-up to a Second World War, has imperialism operated on the world stage with such brazen disregard for legality. Once again, the law of the jungle prevails in international relations. This is the external expression of the turn toward mitigated class war within the imperialist countries driven by a global breakdown of the capitalist system. The persecution of Assange being orchestrated by the US has united a gang of cutthroats, thieves and professional liars. <clears throat> they are collectively the political representatives of an oligarchy whose fabulous wealth is coined from the blood, sweat and tears of countless millions throughout the world. Now such is our record. And this was also the stand on the truth taken by all those who opposed the slander campaign, the witch hunt orchestrated by the CIA and its allies, when so many others, and you know who we are, who they are, abandoning to his fate. It has been a long and it's been a hard struggle, but nevertheless, all of this has only been preparation for the main event that is now underway. The opening of the extradition trial for Julian Assange tomorrow at Woolwich Crown Court is a turning point. It means the fight is joined in earnest Yes, 
in the court itself, between the judiciary, the prosecution and Assange's legal team, and, I might add, against a hostile press which will make up the bulk of the maximum 34 places available to the entire world's media. It's there where the drama will be played out before a public gallery accommodating just 24 people. But as important as this legal fight is, the court is not the arena where Assange's fate will ultimately be determined. If that was the case, then there will be little chance of victory. Assange is one of the best legal teams in the world. He has truth on his side. The case against him is a tissue of lies that runs counter to all legal and democratic norms. He's a publisher, not a whistleblower, and certainly not a hacker. He simply published information that was clearly in the public interest. He's been pursued by a US government made up of war criminals to justify, to cover over their the crimes of their predecessors in Afghanistan, Iraq and elsewhere and clear the path for yet greater crimes. Assad is being charged under the Espionage Act as if he was a spy, not a publisher and a multi-award winning journalist. He's an Australian citizen. The US is arrogating to itself an extraterritorial power to come after foreign nationals, lock them up and throw away the key. The motive for doing so is moreover unarguably political, meaning that the UK has no right to extradite Assange under existing law. The treatment of Assange is not an extradition because no crime has been committed. It is the extraordinary rendition of a political opponent by the Trump administration, the Pentagon and the CIA. And if he's locked up for life, this will be no different to the treatment of the 40 plus people known to be still rotting alive in Guantanamo Bay. If he's given the death penalty, then it will be a state orchestrated assassination of a journalist, just like when US Apache helicopters fired the missile that killed two Reuters war correspondents, as revealed by WikiLeaks. Now these are the issues that, we, that will be argued in court with all their chilling implications for press freedom and basic democratic rights. But one must expect, as is already being proved, that however eloquently the facts and principles are argued, this will be a dialogue of the deaf. Assange faces a kangaroo court and no one should have any faith in it. Even the venue has been chosen to prejudice Assange's case. Woolwich is a high security courtroom that is the preferred venue for terrorism trials. There's a tunnel linking Bellamarsh Maximum Security Prison to the court and it remains to be seen whether Assange will be delivered to his tormentors by this route. District Judge Vanessa Brezza will rule on the extradition proceedings that begin tomorrow, but the power behind the front bench is still Lady Emma Arbuthnot, whose husband, James, is a Conservative MP, closely connected with the armed forces and the security services. He is co-chair of the UK Advisory Board for Defence Manufacturing Thales, and an advisory board member of the Royal United Service Institute for De Defence and Security Studies. There are almost 2,000 references in the WikiLeaks database to fails and nearly 450 to Russi. Lord Arbuthnot is mentioned over 50 times. This week we learned from Matt Kennard and Mark Curtis that Lady Arbuthnot took part in all expenses paid trips sponsored by organisations chaired by her husband to political and corporate partners of the Foreign Office in Spain and Turkey. Now I say all this not to argue for a better judge or more transparent proceedings, let alone to advise Assange's legal team. There are already too many barrack room lawyers 
proofreading the legal case, being mounted without any idea what they're talking about. My essential point is this. If Assange's extradition is to be prevented, were berated to deliver a surprise verdict, or the one that many expected is overturned on appeal, then it will be because the judiciary are too scared to do otherwise. As important as endorsements from prominent personalities, politicians, civil rights groups are in raising awareness even the ones that stayed silent for years, more is needed now than merely changing public opinion. Success depends on mobilising the only social force that strikes fear into the hearts of the world's oligarchs, their judges, their police, their apparatus, their media and their politicians, which is the working class. Now I want to speak here about what separates our approach from that of the Don't, Don't Extradite Assange campaign. The Socialist Equality Party tells the truth, even when it is awkward, uncomfortable or unpopular. Even when moral and political pressure is brought to bear urging silence. And that has been the case, particularly since the formation of the Don't Extradite Assange campaign, as the official spokesman for Assange's freedom. We have, been, we have explained that the pseudo-left groups, including Counterfire, led by John Rees, and above all Jeremy Corbyn, John McDonnell, and the Labour left, have played the key role in isolating Assange and maintaining the cordon sanitaire placed around him by the state and the media. This was epitomised by Corbyn's silence during the last general election, when Assange was just weeks away from facing extradition. We were all told that discretion was required. Don't embarrass Jeremy and prevent a Labour victory because the Corbyn government was Assange's best chance of freedom. Well, we know how that turned out. Victories are not won through political cowardice, but in struggle. And there is no fight in Corbyn because he is loyal to the bureaucracy first, last and always. As a result of this and countless other retreats, Boris Johnson now squats in number 10. The man who declared on April the 11th, quote, it's only right that Julian Assange finally faces justice. Credit to Foreign Office officials who work tirelessly to secure this outcome. Now, only now have Corbyn and McDonnell come out in purely personal support for Assange. They don't speak for the Labour Party. Critical voices we will be told, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Better late than never, and similar. Now historically, of course, the British working class has been too forgiving and too generous to its leaders, by far. And it should, should and will learn to be more ruthless. Nevertheless, if Corbyn and Macdonald had now begun a systematic campaign to mobilise their albeit reduced support base in the working class, then this argument might carry more weight. All sorts of political forces are involved in the campaign to free Assange, who we work alongside because we are not sectarian. Moreover, Corbyn and McDonald's endorsement certainly helped raise Julian Assange's profile. Corbyn's video on Assange has more than a million viewings on Twitter and Facebook. In fact, underscoring what he's been sitting on for all this time. But we will not on that basis conceal our political differences. It cannot be a case of simply letting bygones be bygones, because Corbyn's role and his promotion by the DEA is bound up with an attempt to channel the fight to free Assange in a direction that can only end badly. Corbyn now claims that Boris Johnson, 
based on his response to questions from himself, accepts that the UK-US extradition treaty is unbalanced and not a fair one. And this, he says, is a big change for the British government. He advances this as the basis for pressing Johnson to take a stand against Assange's extradition. Now what really happened? During Prime Minister's questions, Corbyn first asked Johnson about Anne Sekoulas, the CIA operative who ran down and killed Harry Dunn. Calling the extradition with the US one-sided and asking whether Johnson would commit to seeking a more balanced extradition relationship. Johnson said that Corbyn may have a point on the treaty, but insisted, quote, that it is totally different from the case of Harry Dunn and Anne Sekulas. When Corbyn followed up by asking whether Johnson felt Assange's extradition should be opposed, and the rights of journalists and whistleblowers upheld, Johnson replied that he would not comment on any individual cases and then claimed that his government, Assange's tormentor, protects the rights of journalists and whistleblowers. That's what happened. To prove the point, we now know that Harry Dunn's parents have called on the government to block Assange's extradition until Sakalas is returned to the UK. I'll not comment on that at this point. But the response of the Home Secretary Dominic Raab was to declare that extradition terms do not allow any quid pro quo, while the Cabinet Minister, unnamed, warned that blocking Assange's extradition, quote, would drop a nuclear bomb in an already frayed special relationship. Johnson is Trump's ally, his creature, and a fellow warmonger. It has just been revealed that the Tories have already agreed to buy a new range of nuclear warheads for Trident from the US without even bothering to tell anybody. The UK is involved in an ongoing conspiracy with the United States against Assange in pursuit of its own imperialist interests. What change, therefore, is Corbyn speaking about? Not from Johnson, 